All right, we got white again. This time, let's go with e4. And we had a Petrov last time. I'm going to play the super solid four knights. And let's just go with the g3 variation. And my opponent clearly knows what he's doing with black, judging by his speed and confidence here. And then when he gets to <laughs> move, move seven, it's like, I remember the forcing moves. Now i got to think so I don't remember anymore. Okay. Let's ask him what he's doing. If he trades, he just gives me the bishop pair in an open position. Let's keep an eye on e4. Not too quick to move this pawn because of knight d4. The double pawn was actually quite nice here. And I'm looking at utilizing the open b file, especially since his bishop can no longer get to e6 very easily to attack the a pawn if the rook moves. So rooks are designed for open files, and white's getting two open files here at no extra cost. Gotta love it. So that weakens that a bit. Now, I'm interested in getting off this pin, but bishop e3 could go, like e4 could be an interesting sack in some lines. So I'm just going to go with a simple bishop d2, and then queen c1, and now he potentially has to worry about me, me sacrificing on h6. So that move makes a lot of sense. Hits my knight. So let's go with knight h2. One of the nice reasons why I wanted to remove my queen from the pin. And if bishop g6, knight g4 will be strong. Knight g4 may end up getting played anyway, honestly. Because if he takes, I have the bishop pair. And uh, then I could follow up with that forward g-pawn to play g5. So I'm talking myself into it. He's probably worried about me taking here, but I don't want to give up this bishop that is just so good. It's eyeing e4, which that's potential counterplay. And this knight is a defensive knight. If I take, I get give him double pawns, but it's he's got the bishop here, and it's, it's not enough compensation. So my opponent's using a gob of time here to try to figure out what to do in the position. Okay, he hits f2. That seems to be a reasonable move. Let's just go ahead and go bishop e3, and if he takes, great. He's gotten rid of... A good attacking piece that I had on d2 with this idea of knight g4, but at the same time, you know, I needed to defend f2, and that seemed like the most active way to do it. Rook f1 wouldn't do because of bishop e2, and uh, knight g4 would lead to takes, and then takes on f2, so that wouldn't work either. Bishop e3 seemed like a necessity. And my opponent is not managing his time well here, so... Expect to see some blunders relatively quickly. And no need to rush. So let's first see if we can't be bothersome in the position. I'm just going to do a rook lift and see if my opponent will make a decision here. I'm just keeping an eye on e5. All I'm doing. I don't want to take because he would take back with the a pawn and then he could have a potential target. So that's why I'm keeping the tension here. Just keep your weaknesses safe, and you'll have no problems. So, okay. I'm going to come back to this idea with knight g4. And now that should be the breaking point. Let's take here. In between moves, he says... Well, I've got those two, except you have two pieces being attacked. All right. Um, seems good enough. The rook lift earlier gets some justification. And 
and let's go with this move just because he's low on time and queen b8 makes a nice practical threat and now let's get that rook to the seventh to eye some key squares and that'll do it for this one and i believe it's called the gleck four knights this uh g3 line and i played it when i was young um and didn't know openings but i think it's you know a solid system no no like major advantage for white for anything but uh you, you get some interesting games and the other way for the game to go is this solid approach with um, this setup for black which I advocate this type of setup very often in uh, opening oddities my course on chessable facing odd moves and transpositions um, h3 makes a lot of sense then bishop e3 and then you get this uh, dynamic position um, the engine likes black a little bit better than white here, uh, but results are mixed in the database. I'd say it's dynamically equal. I was aware of that that line. And then d5 is the other way to go. And I remember having a game when I was around 1750, and I played against a 1800-rated player in Atlanta in this position, and the game was very, very similar. Um... I believe he played queen f6 a bit earlier. Like, instead of rook e8, queen f6. And f5 is another move to strongly consider here. Where if queen c1, queen f6. And black carries some edge here as well. So, like I said, it's an interesting position. But looks like black, according to the engine's estimation anyway, is just slightly better. But it's quite easy for white to play. So, just a line. Um, but then, if the opponent does not find critical moves and starts getting in time trouble where I have two two minutes and change versus his 35 seconds, that's just not going to be enough. Rook b5, I was trying to provoke a6. I was going to go back and then kind of forces him to trade. It's just using time because he's got 30 seconds. But since he leaves the tension in the position, this now gives me the ability to play some in-between moves. Rook takes b7 is even stronger. And then say bishop there I would have g4 and if he goes here I can take on c6 so what does he do rook e to e7 huh and yeah there's no reason to give up the bishop for the knight like I did in the game the bishop's just better but this was mostly my opponent using gobs of time and then c4 it likes as best. Queen b1 is a good practical move, making the threat to try to win the rook. And now queen b7 is more accurate, but rook e7 with the idea of queen b7 is what I had planned. Because you want to keep an eye on you know this queen here, because you don't want any, any sort of perpetuals. So luckily, the way that the pawns are arranged, especially if I get in c4, it's going to be very difficult for the queen to find... Uh, root for perpetual check and that'll do it for this one